I'm Samuel Au. I'm actually a medical oncologist from the National University Cancer Institute of Singapore. And uh, just a huge disclaimer, I'm a clinician. I don't deal with tech in my daily work, but uh, through my collaboration with BotMD, I realized the opportunities that tech can bring to us in delivering better care to our patients. So my talk, uh, our task today really was to talk about how we try to expand genetic counseling to the digital space. Uh, and we're still really uh, in the very early phases of our work, but I'm happy to be sharing it to all the participants today who might see range from many countries in our region. So the task I got from DOT was, please do not make this a hundred slide boring medical talk about oncology and pathogenesis, which is what I do in my daily life. But if I broke it down, she asked me, why did you guys come up with this idea? And I just synthesized it as what's the problem? How do you design, fail, learn, and iterate? So what's the solution? And what do you hope to do with it? What are our dreams? Again, you know, I mean, this is something that I don't do regularly. So I thought to make it interesting, I wanted to call it from Angelina to Angie. But I got instantaneous feedback that it's too long. So let's start proper. What's the problem? Before we go into what's the problem, we need to ask ourselves, who's Angelina? So once I've come up with these graphics, I'm sure the older ones among us would know her as Lara Croft. Or if you're into gossip, Brad Pitt's ex-wife. Some of you may know that she's the mother of many. And for the younger ones who go to the cinema, she's Cena of the Eternal. But to the medical sphere, she's actually a BRCA1 mutation carrier and she brought about the Angelina effect. So this is her family. And you can see that this is a very interesting family, at least from the cancer perspective. Her mother, maternal aunt, maternal cousin, and maternal great grand aunt all had breast cancer. In fact, her mother had both breast and ovarian cancer. So two not so common events coming into one. And the males in her family were not spared, with her maternal grandfather having sweat gland cancer and her maternal uncle having prostate cancer. So this family history is pretty telling. Something is just wrong. What happened was that she told the world that she tested positive for a faulty copy of the BRCA1 gene, which is associated with hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome, or HBOC. So what's BRCA1? So BRCA1 is partner of BRCA2. They are important cancer protection genes present in all humans from birth, present on different chromosomes, but suffice to say, they are inherited. So if one is born with a faulty copy of the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, one's risk of cancer increases significantly. How significant would it be? Let's put it to you that the average lifetime risk of breast cancer in a woman in the population is about eight to 10%. But in a BRCA1-2 carrier, this risk goes up to 65 and in some reports, 80%. Also, ovarian cancer is a rare cancer with less than 1% of the population having it. But if you are a mutation carrier, this risk goes up again to the 60s, which is significant. But males are not spared. So BRCA1 and BRCA2 do not discriminate against just women alone. You can get male breast cancer, albeit less commonly. You can get pancreas cancer, which we know is deadly, and you can get a much more common variant of prostate cancer, which affects many. Now this faulty copy of the BRCA1 can be passed on to the next generation, and it's passed on in a 50-50 uh, way. So if the family member inherits the faulty copy, then he or she is at increased risk of cancer. But if the family member does not inherit the faulty copy from the parent, then he or she is at average risk of cancer. So you can see in this pedigree, you have an affected father and affected, unaffected mother who have four children. And you can see that none of, not all of the children will be affected. But in Angelina's Jolie's case, she was the affected daughter. One may ask, you know, this is something that's in boring. So what if you find out, what can you do? You can protect yourself just like her. How did she protect herself? She did it in a pretty drastic manner. She removed both breasts of what we call bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. This really decreases 
the breast cancer risk by up to 95%, which is huge, but at a cost. She also removed both ovaries and fallopian tubes, or what we call bilateral something ovarectomy. And why would she do that? Because ovarian cancer has poor screening strategies and it's difficult to detect in the early stage. And by doing so, she reduced her ovarian cancer risk by 80% and along the way also reduced her breast cancer risk at the same time. But of course, this is something that not every young woman particularly would be able to make and definitely not without information. But while they're thinking, we can also start enhanced cancer screening by doing cancer screening earlier because of their high risk. So some of you may know that breast cancer screening is recommended for all women of average risk with a mammogram. But instead of just doing a mammogram, we do MRI breasts. Instead of starting at age 40, we start at age 25. And also we recommend screening for other cancers such as ovarian cancer with more frequent screening. And for males, we also can do prostate and male breast cancer screening. So there are things we can do to help protect mutation carriers, but only if we know that they have a faulty copy of the cancer protection gene. So testing is key. So for those who develop cancer, we can also tailor the cancer treatment according to their mutation status. So the benefit actually extends to the cancer-free and cancer patients. For example, chemotherapy choices can be adjusted. Instead of regular chemotherapy, we can choose a particular class called a platinum chemotherapy, which is preferentially effective against these cancers. But we now also have personalized medicine that are non-chemotherapeutic options and are in tablet forms and may not cause hair loss. So you have four FDA-approved uh, drugs now in the market for ovarian cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and pancreatic cancer. So it's no longer a dream that we can target cancers if they're born with a genetic problem. With knowledge comes power, but this power comes only when you have genetic knowledge. Now, how do we diagnose patients with HBOC then? Let's go through a journey of a patient undergoing genetic testing. So all starts of a patient. This is a pedigree. You can see an arrow at the bottom corner, and that refers to my patient, a 32-year-old patient with newly diagnosed breast cancer, as well as her sister who had breast cancer at a young age of 40, and her mom who died of breast cancer at 65. Her mom had a sister with ovarian cancer at 44, and a brother who succumbed to pancreatic cancer at 55. So there's clustering of breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancers. And from what little bit I've already told you, I think you can say that there is some suspicion of HBOC. And this patient obviously would have this idea or really question, am I at risk of HBOC? So all patients suspected to have HBOC are assessed in the cancer genetics clinic. It all starts off with them finding a doctor to raise their query, and then a referral is made to the cancer genetics clinic. And if you are like, lucky enough to get one soon, you find a genetic specialist as well as, as a genetic counselor. And then you start an odyssey of pre-test counseling, genetic testing, as well as post-test counseling that's not done in a single session. But the first part would be familial assessment. It's the family suspicious for hereditary cancer syndrome. It's genetic testing advised. And then we go through pre-test counseling. We educate the patient on HBOC. We assess the motivation for testing. We discuss the risk and limitations. And then we talk about the impact on self and family, both medically as well as in the uh, society, especially in terms of things like insurability. This process can be lengthy depending on how long-winded the medical professional is or how many questions the patient has. And you may need multiple sessions if the patient is undecided. Then you go on to a genetic test if the patient's agreeable. And this is simple, it's a blood draw. And then after that, approximately two months later, we have post-test counseling. We we'll disclose the genetic test results. We explain the implication of the results on the patient, on the family. We speak to the family to see whether they need testing and we tailor a cancer screening and risk reduction strategy for the patient. 
but there were and there probably still are obstacles. Let's look at the different phases and isolate the early phase. So initially, we know that patients and non-cancer physicians had poor awareness, but Angelina changed everything. After her op-ed in the New York Times, the Google search rate for BRCA increased by two times, and the testing rate for BRCA1 mutation increased by 40 times. Then, referral to our in-house cancer genetic service also increased exponentially, with ovarian cancer patients being referred from a baseline of 4% to 42%. Uptake of genetic testing has also increased from about 10 to 20% to more than 60%. And then with the advent of FDA approval of new drugs, it facilitated testing for the sake of understanding if the patient could take a non-chemotherapeutic option. And therefore, we realized that more than 50% of brain cancer patients agreed to test not for their families, not to understand their genetic risk, but really to see if they could change the treatment. And as our outreach to healthcare professionals, we organized cancer genetics workshops for doctors in the region to improve their understanding so as to bolster the genetic testing endeavor. But towards the tail end, we still need to see the genetics clinic. And we have a mismatch in supply and demand. So Singapore is fortunate because we're a small country with lots of resources, but even our resources are limited because we have not enough cancer genetic counselors, not enough clinic space with a long waiting time, with a long consult time, but yet we have an ever increasing number of patients who will require genetic counseling and testing. So unfortunately, the problem is with us now. Then came the COVID-19 pandemic. So COVID-19 actually accelerated the adoption of telemedicine in Asia Pacific and really brought forward our capabilities um, by three to seven years. It increased the public as well as healthcare professionals' acceptability of telemedicine. And I'm sure for many of you, you saw a sharp rise in telemedicine users, which is huge. So then we come to what's the solution? So we thought, could we harness the digital space to increase awareness, to increase uptake, and to increase accessibility? But as always, we have to mention the dirty words in a scalable and flexible manner. So which part can we digitalize? Let's reimagine genetic counseling. So I bring to you the three phases again. This is definitely the most laborious part of the journey. We have information trawling, we need to obtain medical history and family history, and in this day and age where we may not be as close to our distant relatives, we have to jolt the patient's memory before we can really assess the risk for HVOC. Can we automate this on a digital platform? And then in person, we educate them on HVOC, we talk about the pros and cons of genetic testing, and we assess their motivation for testing before we even land on decision making. Can we pre-educate the patient to reduce time for inpatient consults and facilitate decision making? And then for patients who are undecided, can we provide regular nudges to help clarify their doubts? For patients who underwent genetic testing, can we reinforce the knowledge and encourage cancer screening for themselves and their families? So all this hope is to deliver targeted in-person counseling so that we can improve the efficiency of the entire process and have greater bandwidth to see more patients and benefit more. So here I introduce Angie. Angie is part of our project Engage and expanding access to genetic counseling. And she's a WhatsApp-based chatbot who brings risk assessment and genetic counseling out of the clinic into the home. We have pre-test and post-test counseling modules. And Angie is really powered through a collaboration by the Ancest Cancer Genetics Team and BotMD in collaboration with Pfizer. So how do we put Angie in action? So when a patient is, has a query and Things they need to be seen by the cancer genetics clinic, they're referred. But while being referred, they're sent a WhatsApp message to be enrolled onto Angie. And then we onboard them to a pre-test counseling module. 
which includes demographics, medical history, family history, and then we do targeted education. We talk about what's HBOC, we talk about what's genetic counseling, and how is genetic testing done. And of course, because we have a high no-show rate, we send them appointment reminders. So we thought that Angie cannot exist just as a simple board. We needed to create a universe, an Angie omni-channel, using WhatsApp buttons to get them ready to answer questions, to use natural language processing and power this chat so that we can answer it in as colloquial a way possible. We have YouTube videos for those who want a more and richer AV kind of experience. And we have infographics to sort of give them information. So we thought we should break it down to bite-sized pieces into what you need to know, what is good to know, maybe what some would want to know. And also, if you still don't know, then you come to the clinic. We also trained Angie to counsel patients at different knowledge levels. So we trained her with lay people, with medical students and healthcare staff to have that spectrum of knowledge. So how does Angie currently interface with our cancer genetic clinic? So, you know, our hope is that when the patient has seen Angie, they come already educated, but still have some questions that we can answer in person. Targeted fashion with a faster decision-making process. And if the patient says, let's proceed with genetic testing, then we go on to the post-counseling module on Angie, which sends them encouraging or reassuring messages while they wait that two month period for the genetic test results, where surely some, if not many, are still quite anxious. And if yet they're not ready, they still need some time, we do not give up on them, but we send them targeted messages to provide that little nudge to make the decision, because we know that if you do nothing, the waiting time is not gonna change anything. How do we follow them up for post-test counseling? We know that patients can be found to have a mutation, they can be found to have no mutation, or they could be found to have an uncertain mutation, but regardless, they still need some post-test follow-up. So Angie sends targeted messages on WhatsApp based on the test results and gives them information on cancer screening because even if you have no genetic mutations, you still deserve cancer screening. For BRCA1 mutation carriers, we know that there needs to be cascade testing for family members. So Angelina Jolie only found out because her mother was diagnosed with BRC1 mutation. And so she went to do cascade testing so Angie can do that nudge. Because the true test of the effectiveness of genetic testing really is the follow-up action of cancer screening and prevention for both patients and family. And though we launched it to the world, at least in Singapore, on several press platforms, so what did we learn? I think we learned lots. We started off in a small way so that we can understand our audience. We had our initial 66 patients enrolled with 149 unique encounters. More than 50% agreed to genetic testing on their first encounter and 100% scored full marks on the post-counseling knowledge quiz, presumably saying that the knowledge could be retained. On a satisfaction score of one to five, 83% rated us four or more. We also conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with selected patients. The key takeaway is that patients don't like to fill forms. If you look at the modules from, um, you know, taking demographics, medical, social history, and family history, the completion rates dwindled with time, which is why we needed to top up the information when we saw them in clinic. So how do we simplify the information trawling process, especially family history that's integral? And then the pre visit survey was dismal in terms of completion rates, but it's important because how do we incorporate questions to allow for better iterations in the future? So Doc says, how do we not make Angie annoying in the process? So we also found out that patients didn't know Angie was smart. Very few of them asked Angie questions. She needs to be friendlier. Most patients just click buttons. So we need to have a more comprehensive list of potential questions that we can push. We also heard very interesting feedback that Angie used infantilizing language. You know, she sort of made this entire process not serious, 
which may not be bad for some people. And that emoji is trivialized the conversation. I guess that would be subjective. But definitely, particularly for those who are ocularly impaired, infographics are too small to be seen on the phone. And we had Bot MD come in for an in-person observation in clinic. And for the first time in my entire career, someone told me it was a sales pitch. So can we bring the clinic sales experience directly to your mobile phone? So what's NG version two? We want to redesign patient forms and surveys. We want to use automated reminders to fill in forms, but yet in a non-annoying manner, if possible. We want a dashboard to track progress so that our genetic counselors have an easier time. We want smaller infographic sites. We also thought perhaps we could launch a website through WhatsApp so that patients can scroll. So from a phone, you get a WhatsApp uh, link to a website talking about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. You can look through what's a genetic test and talk about what happens after genetic testing. And of course, we wonder whether we should have a live video to bring that live experience to patients before they come to clinic. But what are our dreams? And there are many for the way ahead. I envision a multilingual and omnipresent NG like an eternal. I would like to expand her language capability. Can NG be a polyglot? We're translating her to Mandarin. Could she talk in Bahasa? Could she speak to a Filipina in Tagalog or really speak in Tamil to someone in India? Can we expand her cultural sensitivities? Because let's make this clear. The auntie in Singapore, the mark chick in Indonesia, and the uncle in Philippines are different. Can we deliver the nudges differently depending on the cultural context? Can we expand her disease indications? Because we know that we need Angie's siblings to help champion our cause to engage others for other hereditary cancer syndromes like Lynn syndrome that causes a lifetime risk of colorectal cancer of 80%, which is huge. So we need training partners and we're happy to uh, welcome more. So is that potential? I would say yes, there is. If you look at the global care data for newly diagnosed breast cancers in the past five years, Singapore saw 15,000 breast cancers, Malaysia 29,000, Indonesia 200,000, Philippines 85,000, Thailand 76,000, and India a staggering 459,000. And we know that amongst all of them, approximately 5% could have BRCA1 to mutations, but we need to test many more to find that 5%. And how do we engage them across cultural borders as well as barriers to, to provide access to genetic counseling and testing, particularly in countries where there's actually zero genetic testing capability? And don't forget, HBOC is not just about breast cancer, so we're talking about millions and potentially billions. We've also started baby steps in public education because of our mission. So a patient could go to the Ensis Cancer Genetics website and see a public facing version of NG with a quick risk assessment form to really talk about whether or not he or she should consider genetic testing and then push them through the chat. Some videos of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, more for public education. So to sum it up, why is Angie here to stay? It's because HBOC is a sizable problem. There's increasing public awareness thanks to the real Angelina, but more can be done. The current bottleneck is the limitation in cancer genetic services for genetic counseling. And we hope to harness the potential of the digital space to improve outreach increase efficiency and benefit more patients. Now, we know that digitalization is feasible, but from our experience, we know it cannot completely replace the human touch, which is why we've embraced Angie into our cancer genetics team, but there's still much work to be done. And this is all really in keeping with our national initiative of a healthier SG to move from healthcare to health because we know that cancer genetics is really about upstream diagnosis and prevention so that one may live well and be well. 
So I thank you very much for joining us on this Saturday morning.